there is a beautiful incident that occurred around Ashtavakra. When Janaka Maharaja, the emperor, became enlightened, a rare thing, an emperor becoming enlightened. It's not only a rare thing, it is a fantastic thing because an enlightened ruler means many things to the people. That is no better blessing. So when it happened, Ashtavakra, his guru, as gurus are known to be always difficult, when you just think you found your way, they tell you that's not it. <laughs> when Janaka thought he's enlightened and this is it, Ashtavakra said, that's not it, you have to go back and rule the kingdom because you may not want it, that's not the point. The point is people deserve an enlightened king. So, Janaka, whenever he found time, he made his trips to Ashtavakra's hermitage in the little deep into the jungle. So, Janaka making regular trips to the hermitage. Obviously, because gurus are lonely people, you know. Because where to find enlightened company? <laughs> Very difficult. So, obviously, both of them enjoying a certain rapport, both of them enjoying each other's company, all the other disciples saw this, that Ashtavakra, the great being, has a… seems to have a certain weakness for the emperor whenever he comes, they are chatting away, laughing together, this, this, this. These people who have left everything or they think they have left everything and come and they are here as sannyasis, not paying enough attention to them. But if you leave them ten minutes with him, they won't know what to do next. So there is little bit of resentment building up. Ashtavakra is conscious of it, he let it build up because every build up is a possibility. Something should build up, <laughs> then only you can do something. If nothing builds up, that means there are dead people around, <laughs> not live people. <laughs> if live people are there, something must build up. Joy must build up, love must build up, ecstasy must build up or at least resentment or hatred or jealousy, something must build up. Something is building up means we can do something with them, nothing. What to do with them? <laughs> so he let it build up and then this incident occurred. Janaka also came and he was sitting in the satsang at the back and as the Ashtavakra was speaking something, suddenly a soldier burst into the satsang and without even looking at the guru, he ran to the emperor with a loud voice, he said, the palace is on fire, you need to come right now. Janaka said, get out of here, how dare you run into the satsang Without bowing down to my guru, you run here and shout some nonsense, just get out of here. And Ashtavakra continued with whatever had to happen. So Janaka just sat there, palace burning. Nobody is concerned here. There of course they are screaming, but here nobody is concerned. Then this continued, it's a lap of the master event, three days, you know. <laughs> Till you feel your legs have had enough, it continues. <laughs> mm. 
Then it was going on and one of the boys who is helping around in the ashram ran into the satsang and said, a bunch of monkeys are playing havoc with these brahmacharis' clothes. The moment this boy said this, many of them got up and ran to save the clothing. What is their clothing? Not designer stuff, it is designer of course, but just a piece of loincloth, a piece of cloth. They ran to save those cloths and then they chased away the monkeys and recovered whatever they could and they came back. So Ashtavakra continued and then he said, he is an emperor, his palace full of wealth and people, not only physical wealth, there are people, there are lives, people who are dear to him. Palace is burning, but he is concerned about breaking the rhythm of the satsang. You, who claim that you've given up everything in your life for a piece of cloth, without even thinking you run out, without even looking at me, to save a piece of cloth. No, but we have only two, one we are wearing, one is there. The monkeys take it away, what do we do? So we are in a more needy situation than the emperor. Maybe emperor can build another, build another palace, but we… Well, you could learn something from Adam. There are lots of Adam's underwears in the trees <laughs> So Ashtavakra said, the question is not about what you possess, it's about how you possess. Even if you have a kingdom in your hands, you can hold it in a certain way. Kingdom is not necessarily outside in terms of wealth and people and money. For most people their kingdom is their own body and their mind. How you hold it? If you hold it one way, it will make you bleed with pain. If you hold it another way, you will be spot on with life because it doesn't take effort to be life. I'm just reminding you, you are life. Hello? Yes, <laughs> you are. Just see the rock which is standing next to you, how simple and easy it is. Yes or no? If you were not life, how simple and easy it is. This is why people want to drown themselves in alcohol and drug and excessive food and something else and something else or the toilet cleaning. Because in some way, you have discovered not being life is so simple and easy. If you're not very alive, it's so simple and easy, just sit somewhere like, like a rock. But when the moment of death comes, you know you are life pretending to be something else, otherwise you couldn't die. <laughs> that will become a point of inflection. So, we want you to be conscious, this is the reason why I'm constantly reminding you, you will die one day, you will die one day, I'm not wishing death for you. It's just that without my help it'll happen, I'm confident about that. I don't have to wish you death, you anyway will die. So constant reminder of death is just this, to make you know your life. You can't go about like this rock, you can't go about like a mechanical creature who can walk and talk and do everything that you can do but cannot be alive. That's an important thing. Is it an important thing? No, no, no. If I can do what somebody can do, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter whether I'm alive or not, isn't it? If I can do things as good as somebody else, 
if I can be as successful as somebody else, if I can possess what somebody else has or nobody else has, that's good enough. For most human beings that's good enough. So in many ways, unconsciously they have understood the solution for life is not to be life. But that's not a solution, that's a deception because no matter what you do, even if you die, that proves you are life. When you're alive, if you don't prove that you're life, when you die at least you prove that you were life, yes or no? So you cannot escape this, neither with tricks of life nor with death, you cannot escape this. So is it a trap? It is not a trap. It is a tremendous possibility. The soil that you walk upon is aspiring to become life. If there was no aspiration, it wouldn't stand up as a tree. There is… that which is not life is aspiring to become life. Otherwise, nothing would happen in the universe. Everything is aspiring to become life and become the peak of life. You can call this evolutionary process, you can call this whatever you want, but essentially everything that is not life is aspiring to become life. Everything that is life is aspiring to become a higher life. This is not a teaching, this is not a scripture, this is not somebody's ideology, this is the way. Life is always… this aspiration is there. The only way you can quieten it is by pretending to be not life or by getting enlightened. Both these things will do the same. Tch, same result, but worlds apart. Detachment acquired, liberation attained. Ashtavakra said, To be free, shun the experiences of the senses like poison. Turn your attention to forgiveness, sincerity, kindness, simplicity, truth. You are not earth, water, fire or air, nor are you empty space. Liberation is to know yourself as awareness alone, the witness of these. Abide in awareness with no illusion of person. You will be instantly free and at peace. You have no caste or duties. You are invisible, unattached, formless. You are the witness of all things. Be happy. Right and wrong, pleasure and pain, exist in mind only. They are not your concern. You neither do nor enjoy. You are free. You are the solitary witness of all that is, forever free. Your only bondage is not seeing this. The thought, I am the doer, is the bite of a poisonous snake. To know I do nothing 
is the wisdom of faith. Be happy. A single understanding, I am the one awareness, consumes all suffering in the fire of an instant. Be happy. You are unbounded awareness, bliss, supreme bliss, in which the universe appears like the mirage of a snake in a rope. Be happy. It is true what they say. You are what you think. If you think you are bound, you are bound. If you think you are free, you are free. You are self, the solitary witness. You are perfect, all pervading, one. You are free, desireless, forever still. The universe is but a seeming in you. Meditate on this. I am awareness alone, unity itself. Give up the idea that you are a separate person that there is within and without. You have long been bound thinking, I am a person. Let the knowledge, I am awareness alone, be the sword that frees you. You are now and forever free, luminous, transparent, still. The practice of meditation keeps one in bondage. You are pure consciousness, the substance of the universe. The universe exists within you. Don't be small-minded. You are unconditioned, changeless, formless. You are solid, unfathomable, cool. Desire nothing. You are consciousness. That which has form is not real. Only the formless is permanent. Once this is known, you will not return to illusion. Just as a mirror exists both within and without the image reflected, so the Supreme Self exists both within and without the body. Just as the same space exists both within and without a jar, the timeless, all-pervasive one exists as totality. Number two, joy of self-realization. Janaka said, I am now spotless and at peace awareness beyond consciousness. All this time I have been duped by illusion. By this light alone, the body and the universe appear. I am everything or nothing. Seeing there is no universe or body, by grace the self is revealed. As waves, foam, and bubbles are not different from water, so the universe emanating from self is not different from self. Look closely at cloth. You see only threads. Look closely at creation. 
you see only self. As sweetness pervades sugarcane juice, I am the essence of creation. Not seeing self, the world is materialized. Seeing self, the world is vanished. A rope is not a snake, but can appear to be. I am not other than light. The universe manifests at my glance. The mirage of universe appears in me, as silver appears in mother of pearl, as a snake appears in a rope, as water appears on a desert horizon. As a pot returns to clay, a wave to water, a bracelet to gold, so will the universe return to me. I am wonderful indeed, beyond adoration. I cannot decay, nor ever die, though God and all the universes should perish to the last blade of grass. I am wonderful indeed, beyond adoration. Even with a body, I am one. I neither come nor go. I am everywhere at once. I am wonderful indeed, beyond adoration. I am astounded at my powers. The universe appears within me. But I do not touch it. I am wonderful indeed, beyond adoration. I am everything thought or spoken and have nothing. In reality, knowledge, the knower, and the knowable do not exist. I am the transparent self in which through ignorance they appear. Looking at one and seeing many is the cause of all misery. The only cure is to realize that what is seen is not there. I am one, aware, blissful, immaculate. I am unbounded awareness. Only in imagination do I have limits. Reflecting on this, I abide in the absolute. I am neither free nor bound. The illusion of such things has fallen into disbelief. Though I contain creation, it has no substance. Having seen for certain that this universe and body is without form or substance, I am revealed as awareness alone. Imagination has no place here. The body exists only in imagination, as do heaven and hell, bondage, freedom, fear. Are these my concern? I, who am pure awareness? I see no differences or separation. Even the multitudes appear as a single formless desert. To what should I cling? I am not the body. I do not have a body. I am awareness, not a person. My thirst for life bound me to a seeming of life. In the limitless ocean of self, the winds of the mind roil the myriad waves of the world. But 
When the wind subsides in the limitless ocean, the arc of personhood is swallowed up along with the universe it carries. And how wonderful it is in the limitless ocean of self. Waves of beings arise, collide, play for a time, then disappear, as is their nature. Number three, test of self-realization. Ashtavakra said, having realized yourself as one, being serene and indestructible, why do you desire wealth? Just as imagining silver in mother of pearl causes greed to arise, so does ignorance of self cause desire for illusion. Having realized yourself as that in which the waves of the world rise and fall, why do you run around in turmoil? Having realized yourself as pure awareness, as beautiful beyond description, how can you remain a slave to lust? It is strange that in a sage who has realized self in all and all in self, this sense of ownership should continue. Strange that one abiding in the absolute, intent on freedom, should be vulnerable to lust and weakened by amorous pastimes. Strange that knowing lust as an enemy of knowledge, one so weak and nearing death, should still crave sensual pleasure. Strange that one who is unattached to the things of this world and the next, who can discriminate between the transient and the timeless, who yearns for freedom, should yet fear the dissolution of the body. Whether acclaimed or tormented, the serene sage abides in self. He is neither gratified nor angered. A great soul witnesses his body's actions as if they were another's. How can praise or blame disturb him? Realizing the universe is illusion, having lost all curiosity, how can one of steady mind fear death? With whom can we compare the great soul who, content knowing self, remains desireless in disappointment? Why should a person of steady mind, who sees the nothingness of objects, prefer one thing to another? He who is unattached, untouched by opposites, free of desire, experiences neither pleasure nor pain as events pass through. Number four, glorification of self-realization. Janaka said, Surely one who knows self, though he plays the game of life, differs greatly from the world's bewildered, burdened beasts. Truly, the yogi feels no elation, though he abides in the exalted state, yearned for by Indra and all the discontented gods. Surely, one who knows that is not touched by virtue or vice, just as space is not touched by smoke, though it appears to be. Who can prevent the great soul, who knows the universe as self, from living life as it comes? Of the four kinds of beings, from Brahma to a blade of grass, only the sage can renounce aversion and desire. Rare is he who knows himself as one with no other, the Lord of the universe. 
He acts as he knows and is never afraid. Number five, four ways to dissolution. Ashtavakra said, You are immaculate, touched by nothing. What is there to renounce? The mind is complex. Let it go. Know the peace of dissolution. The universe arises from you like foam from the sea. Know yourself as one. Enter the peace of dissolution. Like an imagined snake in a rope, the universe appears to exist in the immaculate self, but does not. Seeing this, you know there is nothing to dissolve. You are perfect, changeless, through misery and happiness, hope and despair, life and death. This is the state of dissolution. Number six, the higher knowledge. Janaka said, I am infinite space. The universe is a jar. This I know. No need to renounce, accept, or destroy. I am a shoreless ocean. The universe makes waves. This I know. No need to renounce, accept, or destroy. I am mother of pearl. The universe is the illusion of silver. This I know. No need to renounce, accept, or destroy. I am in all beings. All beings are in me. This I know. No need to renounce, accept, or destroy. Number seven, nature of self-realization. Janaka said, In me, the shoreless ocean, the arc of universe, drifts here and there on the winds of its nature. I am not impatient. In me, the shoreless ocean, let the waves of the universe rise and fall as they will. I am neither enhanced nor diminished. In me, the shoreless ocean, the universe is imagined. I am still and formless. In this alone I abide. The self is not in objects, nor are objects in the pure and infinite self. The self is tranquil, free of attachment and desire. In this alone I abide. I am awareness alone. The world is a passing show. How can thoughts arise of acceptance or rejection? And where? Number eight, bondage and liberation. Ashtavakra said, When the mind desires or grieves things, accepts or rejects things, is pleased or displeased by things, this is bondage. When the mind does not desire or grieve, accept or reject, become pleased or displeased, liberation is at hand. If the mind is attached to any experience, this is bondage. When the mind is detached from all experience, this is liberation. When there is no I, there is only liberation. When I appears, bondage appears with it. Knowing this, it is effortless to refrain from accepting and rejecting. 
Number nine, detachment. Ashtavakra said, opposing forces, duties done and left undone, when does it end and for whom? Considering this, be ever desireless, let go of all things and to the world turn an indifferent eye. Rare and blessed is one whose desire to live, to enjoy, and to know has been extinguished by observing the ways of men. Seeing all things as threefold suffering, the sage becomes still, insubstantial, transient, contemptible, The world is fit only for rejection. Was there an age or time men existed without opposites? Leave the opposites behind. Be content with what is perfection. The greatest seers, saints, and yogis agree on little. Seeing this, Who could not be indifferent to knowledge and become still? One who, through worldly indifference, through serenity and reason, sees his true nature and escapes illusion. Is he not a true teacher? In the myriad forms of the universe, see the primal element alone. You will be instantly free and abide in the self. Desire creates the world. Renounce it. Renounce desires and you renounce the world. Now, you may live as you are. Number 10. Quietude. Ashtavakra said, Give up desire, which is the enemy. Give up prosperity, which is born of mischief and good works. Be indifferent. Look upon friends, lands, wealth, houses, wives, gifts, and all apparent good fortune as a passing show as a dream lasting three to five days. Where there is desire, there is the world. Be firm in non-attachment. Be free of desire. Be happy. Bondage and desire are the same. Destroy desire and be free. Only by detaching from the world does one joyfully realize self. You are one. Awareness itself. The universe is neither aware nor does it exist. Even ignorance is unreal. What is left to know? Attached as you have been to kingdoms, sons, wives, bodies, pleasures, life after life, still they are now lost forever. Prosperity, pleasure, pious deeds, enough. In the dreary forest of the world, the mind finds no rest. For how many lifetimes have you done hard and painful labor with body, mind, and speech. It is time to stop. Number 11. Wisdom. Ashtavakra said, Existence, non-existence, change, this is the nature of things. Realizing this, stillness, serenity, and bliss naturally follow. One who knows for certain that self creates all and is alone becomes still, 
desireless, unattached. One who knows for certain that adversity and success come and go in obedience to destiny becomes content. He neither desires nor grieves. One who knows for certain that birth and death, happiness and misery come and go in obedience to destiny sees nothing to accomplish. He engages in non-action and in action remains unattached. One who has realized that only by caring is misery caused in the world becomes free, happy, serene, desireless. I am not the body, nor is the body my possession. I am awareness itself. One who realizes this for certain has no memory of things done or left undone. There is only the Absolute. From Brahma to the last blade of grass, I alone exist. One who knows this for certain becomes immaculate, serene, unconflicted. Attainment has no meaning. One who knows for certain that this manifold and wonderful universe is nothing becomes desireless awareness and abides in the stillness of no thing. Number 12. Abiding in the Self Janaka said, Becoming first intolerant of action, then of excessive speech, then of thought itself, I come to be here. Neither sounds nor other sense perceptions attract my attention. Even the self is unperceived. The mind is free, undistracted, one-pointed, and here I am. Effort is required to concentrate a distracted mind superimposed with illusion. Knowing this, I remain here. Nothing to reject, nothing to accept, no joy, no sorrow. Lord God, I am here. The four stages of life, life without stages, meditation, renunciation, objects of mind, nothing but distractions. I am forever here. Doing and not doing both arise from ignorance. I know this, and I am here. Thinking of the unthinkable one unavoidably conjures thought. I choose no thought, and remain here. Blessed is he who attains this by effort. Blessed is he who is such by nature. Thirteen, happiness. Janaka said, The tranquil state of knowing self alone is rare, even among those who own but a loincloth. I therefore neither renounce nor accept and am happy. The body is strained by practices. The tongue tires of scripture. The mind numbs with meditation. Detached from all this, I live as I am. Realizing that nothing is done, I do what comes and am happy. Yogis who preach either effort or non-effort are still attached to the body. I neither dissociate nor associate with any of that and am happy. 
I have nothing to gain or lose by standing, walking, or sitting down. So whether I stand, walk, or sit, I am happy. I do not lose by sleeping, nor attain by effort. Not thinking in terms of loss or gain, I am happy. Pleasure and pain fluctuate and are inconsistent. Without good or bad, I live happily. Number 14. Tranquility. Janaka said, Though appearing asleep like other men, one whose interest in the world is exhausted, whose mind has been emptied, who thinks only by inadvertence, is in reality awake. When desire has melted, how can there be wealth or friends, or the seduction of senses, of what use is scripture and knowledge. I have realized the Supreme Self, the Witness, the One. I am indifferent to bondage and freedom. I have no need for liberation. The inner condition of one who is devoid of doubt, yet moves among creatures of illusion, can only be known by those like him. Number 15. Knowledge of the Self Ashtavakra said, A man of open intuition may realize self upon hearing a casual instruction, while a man of cluttered intellect inquires bewildered for a lifetime. Aversion to the world's offerings is liberation. Attraction to the world's offerings is the suffering of bondage. This is the truth. Now, do as you please. This knowledge of truth turns an eloquent, wise, and active man mute, empty, and inert. Lovers of the world therefore shun it. You are not the body. You do not have a body. You neither do nor enjoy. You are awareness alone, the timeless witness. You are free. Go in happiness. Attachment and aversion are attributes of the mind. You are not the mind. You are consciousness itself, changeless, undivided, free. Go in happiness. Realize self in all and all in self. Be free of personal identity and the sense of mine. Be happy. You are that in which the universe appears like waves appearing in the ocean. You are consciousness itself. No need to worry. Have faith, my son. Have faith. You are awareness alone, the self, the one. You are the Lord of nature. The body is made of worldly stuff. It comes, it lingers, it goes. The self neither comes nor goes, yet remains. Why mourn the body? If the body lasts until the end of time, or perishes today, is there gain or loss for you? You who are pure awareness? Let the waves of the universe rise and fall as they will. You have nothing to gain or lose. You are the ocean. You are the substance of consciousness. 
the world is you. Who is it that thinks he can accept or reject it? And where does he stand? In you who are one, immaculate, still awareness, from where can birth, action, or a separate person arise? Whatever you perceive is you and you alone. How can bracelets, armlets, and anklets be other than the gold they are made of? Leave behind such distinctions as I am he and I am not this. Consider everything self. Be desireless and be happy. Your ignorance alone creates the universe. In reality, one alone exists. There is no person or God other than you. One who knows for certain that the universe is illusion, a no-thing, becomes desireless, pure awareness, and finds peace in the existence of nothing. In the ocean of existence, only one is, was, and ever will be. You are neither bound nor free. Live content and be happy. Do not stir the mind with yes or no. You are pure consciousness. Be still and abide in the bliss of self. Give up completely all contemplation. Hold nothing in the mind or heart. You are the self, forever free. Of what use is thinking to you? Number 16. Special Instruction Ashtavakra said, You can recite and discuss scripture all you want, but until you drop everything, you will never know truth. You can enjoy and work and meditate, but you will still yearn for that which is beyond all experience and in which all desires are extinguished. Everyone is miserable because they exert constant effort, but no one understands this. A ripe mind can become unshackled upon hearing this one instruction. The master idler, to whom even blinking is a bother, is happy, but he is the only one. When the mind is free of opposites, like this is done and this is yet undone, one becomes indifferent to merit, wealth, pleasure, and liberation. One who abhors sense objects avoids them. One who desires them becomes ensnared. One who neither abhors nor desires is neither detached nor attached. As long as there is desire, which is the absence of discrimination, there will be attachment and non-attachment. This is the cause of the world. Indulgence creates attachment. Aversion creates abstinence. Like a child, the sage is free of both and thus lives on as a child. One who is attached to the world thinks renouncing it will relieve his misery. One who is attached to nothing is free and does not feel miserable even in the world. He who claims liberation as his own, as an attainment of a person, is neither enlightened nor a seeker. He suffers his own misery. Though Hara 
Hari, or the lotus-born Brahma himself instructs you, until you know nothing, you will never know self. Seventeen, the true knower. Ashtavakra said, One has attained knowledge and reaped the fruits of yoga, who is content, purified of attachments, and at home in solitude. The knower of truth is never miserable in the world, for the whole universe is filled with himself alone. As the foliage of the neem tree does not please an elephant who delights in salaki leaves, so do sense objects not please he who delights in self. Rare in the world is one who does not relish past enjoyments, nor yearn for enjoyments to come. Those who desire pleasure and those who desire liberation are both common in the world. Rare is the great soul who desires neither enjoyment nor liberation. Rare is the right-minded person who neither covets nor shuns religion, wealth, pleasure, life, or death. The man of knowledge neither cares for the universe nor desires its dissolution. He lives happily on whatever comes his way. He is blessed. Knowing self, mind empty and at peace, the sage lives happily, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating. There is no attachment or non-attachment for one in whom the ocean of the world has dried up. His look is vacant, senses still. His actions have no purpose. The sage is neither asleep nor awake. He neither closes nor opens his eyes. Thus, for the liberated soul, everywhere there is only this. The liberated soul abides in self alone and is pure of heart. He lives always and everywhere free of desire. Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, taking, speaking, walking, the great soul exerts neither effort nor non-effort. He is truly free. The liberated soul does not blame or praise, give or take, rejoice or become angry. He is everywhere, unattached and free. The great soul remains poised and undisturbed, whether in the presence of a passionate woman or observing the approach of his death. He is truly free. The sage sees no difference between happiness and misery, man and woman, adversity and success. Everything is seen to be the same. In the sage, there is neither violence nor mercy, arrogance nor humility, anxiety nor wonder. His worldly life is exhausted. He has transcended his role as a person. The liberated one neither avoids experience nor craves it. He enjoys what comes and what does not. The sage is not conflicted by states of stillness and thought. His mind is empty. His home is the absolute. Though he may perform actions, the man of knowledge does not act. Desires extinguished, free of thoughts of I and mine, he knows with absolute certainty that nothing exists. 
the sage is free. His empty mind no longer projects delusion, dreaming, dullness. This state is indescribable. 18. Peace. Ashtavakra said, Praise that which is bliss itself, which is by nature stillness and light, and which by its knowing reveals the world as a dream. One may enjoy the abundant pleasures of the world, but will never be happy until giving them up. How can one whose innermost heart has been scorched by the sun of sorrow that comes from duty be happy until the sweet rain of torrential stillness? The universe is but a thought in consciousness. In reality, it is nothing. One who sees the true nature of existence and non-existence never ceases to exist. The self, which is absolute, effortless, timeless, immaculate, is without limits and at no distance from you. You are forever it. For those whose vision becomes unclouded, illusion evaporates and self becomes known. All sorrow is instantly dispelled. Seeing everything is imagination. Knowing the self as timelessly free, the sage lives as a child. Knowing himself as absolute, knowing existence and non-existence to be imagination only, What is there for the desireless one to learn, say, or do? Knowing for certain that all is self, the sage has no trace of thoughts, such as, I am this, or I am not that. The yogi who finds stillness is neither distracted nor focused. He knows neither pleasure nor pain. Ignorance dispelled, he is free of knowing. Heaven or poverty, gain or loss, society or solitude, to the yogi free of conditioning, there is no difference. Religious merit, sensory pleasure, worldly prosperity, discrimination between this and that, These have no significance to the yogi free of opposites, such as, I do this, and this I do not. The yogi who is liberated while living has no duties in this world, no attachments in his heart. His life proceeds without him. For the great soul who abides Beyond desire, where is illusion? Where is the universe? Where is meditation on that? Where even is liberation from them? He who sees the world may try to renounce it. But what can the desireless one do? He sees there is nothing to see. He who has seen the Supreme Brahma thinks, I am Brahma. But he who has transcended all thought, what can he think? He knows no other than self. He achieves self-control who sees his own distraction. But the great soul is not distracted. He has nothing to achieve. He has nothing to do. The man of knowledge may live as an ordinary man, but he is not. He sees he is neither focused nor distracted and finds no fault within himself. He who is beyond existence and non-existence, who is wise, satisfied, and free of desire, does nothing, 
though the world may see him in motion. The wise one is not troubled by action or inactivity. He lives happily, doing whatever gets done. Like a leaf in the wind, the liberated one is untethered from life, desireless, independent, free. For one who has transcended the world, there is no joy or sorrow. With a stilled mind, he lives on with no body. One who knows self, whose mind is serene and spotless, does not desire to give up anything, nor does he miss what is not there. His mind, being in a natural state of emptiness, the wise one knows nothing of honor and dishonor. He does what comes to be done. One who acts knowing this is done by the body, not by I, the self, indeed does nothing, no matter how much acting takes place. The liberated one acts without claiming to be acting, but he is no fool. He is blessed and happy, even though in the world. Having had enough of the endless workings of the mind, the wise one comes to rest. He neither thinks, nor knows, nor hears, nor sees. Beyond stillness, beyond distraction, the great soul thinks nothing of liberation or bondage. Having seen the universe is void, even though it seems to exist, he is God. He who believes he is a person is constantly acting, even when the body is at rest. The sage knows he is not a person and therefore does nothing, even when the body is in motion. The mind of the liberated one is neither troubled nor pleased. It is actionless motionless, desireless, and free of doubt. The liberated one does not exert effort to meditate or act. Action and meditation just happen. Hearing ultimate truth, the dull-witted man is bewildered. The wise man, hearing truth, retreats within and appears dull-witted. The ignorant practice meditation and no thought. The wise, like men in deep sleep, do nothing. The ignorant man finds no peace either by effort or non-effort. The wise man by truth alone is stilled. Though they are by nature self alone, pure intelligence, love and perfection, Though they transcend the universe and our clearness itself, men of the world will not see this through meditation and practices. The ignorant man will never be liberated by his repetitious practices. Blessed is he who, by simple understanding, enters timeless freedom. Because he desires to know God, the ignorant man can never become that. The wise man is God because he is free of desire and knows nothing. Unable to stand steady and eager for salvation, the ignorant perpetuate the illusion of the world. Seeing the world as the source of all misery, the wise cut it off at the root. The fool thinks peace comes by controlling the mind. He will never attain it. The wise one knows truth and is stillness itself. For he who thinks knowledge is things and ideas, how can there be self-knowledge? The wise do not see separate things, only the timeless self. 
The fool tries to control the mind. With the mind, what folly? The wise one delights in self alone. There is no mind to master. Some believe in existence. Others believe nothing exists. Rare is the one who believes nothing and is never confused. Weak intellectuals may believe the self is one without other, but being mirrored in illusion, they do not actually know self, so live out their lives in misery. The mind of one seeking liberation depends on things for perception. The mind of the liberated one perceives no thing and is free of desire. Timid men fear sensory experience much as they do tigers. They seek refuge in caves and try to unthink the world. Sensory experiences are like elephants who, upon encountering a desireless man, see him as a lion. They immediately turn on their heels or, if unable to escape, stay on to flatter and serve him. A man with no doubts, who knows only self, has no need of practice or liberation. Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, he lives happily as he is. One whose mind is emptied and unconflicted by the mere hearing of truth sees nothing to do nothing to avoid, nothing to warrant his indifference. The sage does whatever appears to be done without thinking of good or bad. His actions are those of a child. Depending on nothing, one finds happiness. Depending on nothing, one attains the supreme. Depending on nothing, one passes through tranquility to oneself. When one realizes he is neither the actor nor the one who watches, the mind storm is stilled. The actions of the sage, free of pretense and motive, shine like clear light. Not so those of the deluded seeker, who affects a peaceful demeanor while remaining firmly attached. Unbounded, unfettered, untethered from the projections of mind, the wise are free to play and enjoy, or retire to mountain caves. Whether honoring a spiritual scholar, a god, or holy shrine, whether seeing a desirable woman, a king, or a beloved friend, the heart of the sage is unmoved. Though his servants, sons, wives, daughters, grandchildren, and all his relatives ridicule and despise him, the sage is undismayed. Though pleased, he is not pleased. Though pained, he does not suffer. This wonderful state is understood only by those like him. The belief in duty creates a relative world for its performance. The wise one knows himself to be formless, timeless, all-pervasive, immaculate, and thus transcends duty and world. Even doing nothing, the dull one is anxious and distracted. Even amidst great action, the wise one remains still. Even in practical life, the wise one remains happy. Happy to sit. Happy to sleep. Happy to move about. Happy to speak. Happy to eat because he knows self. The wise one is not disrupted by practical life. He is deep and still 
like a vast lake. He is not like ordinary people. His sorrows have vanished. For the deluded, even rest is an activity. For the wise, even action bears the fruit of stillness. The deluded are often adverse to the things of life. To one with no thought for body, attachment and aversion have no meaning. The deluded mind is caught up in thinking and not thinking. Though the mind of the wise one may think what thoughts come, he is not aware of it. The sage sees nothing being done even when performed by his hands. Like a child, he is pure and acts without reason. Blessed indeed is he who knows self, though seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, he never desires nor changes. For one who is void and changeless, where is the world and its imaginings. Where is the end? Where is the possibility of it? Glorious indeed is he who, free of desire, embodies bliss itself. He has become absorbed in self. In short, the great soul who has realized truth is free of desire enjoyment, and liberation. In all of space and time, he is attached to nothing. What remains for one who is consciousness itself, who sees the non-existence of a phenomenal world created by the mere thought of a name? Peace is natural for one who knows for certain nothing exists, who sees appearances are illusion, to whom the inexpressible is apparent. Rules of conduct, detachment, renunciation, asceticism, what are these to one who sees the unreality of things, who is the light of awareness? How can there be joy or sorrow bondage, or liberation for one who perceives non-existence and lights the infinite. Until self-realization, illusion prevails. The sage lives without thoughts of I or mine. His connection to illusion is severed. What is knowledge? What is universe? What are thoughts like I am the body, or the body is mine. The sage is imperishable and sorrowless. He is self alone. When a weak man gives up meditation, he falls prey to whims and desires. Even hearing truth, the man of dull intellect holds on to illusion. Through effort and suppression, He may appear outwardly composed, but inside he craves the world. Though others may see him working, the sage does nothing. Knowledge has banished effort. He finds no reason to do or say. The sage is fearless, unassailable, no darkness, no light, nothing to lose nothing. Patience, discrimination, even fearlessness, what use are these to the yogi? His nature cannot be described. He is not a person. No heaven, no hell, no liberation for the living. In short, consciousness is void. What more can be said? The sage neither yearns for fulfillment nor frets over non-attainment. His mind is cool and brimming with sweetness. 
detached from desire, the sage neither praises peace nor blames the wicked. Equally content in happiness and misery, he would not change a thing. The sage neither rejects the world nor desires self. He is free of joy and sorrow. He does not live and cannot die. The wise one lives without hope. He has no attachment to his children, wife, or anyone. Pleasure means nothing to him. His life is glorious. The sage wanders about as he pleases and lives on whatever may come. Contentment ever dwells in his heart. And when the sun sets, he rests where he is. Rooted in being, no thought of being born or reborn, the great soul is indifferent to the death or birth of his body. The wise one stands alone, caring for nothing, bereft of possessions. He goes where he will, unhindered by opposites, his doubts rent asunder. He is truly blessed. The wise one has no sense of mine. To him, earth, stone, and gold are the same. The knots of his heart have unraveled. He knows neither ignorance nor sorrow. He is excellent in every way. The liberated soul has no desire in his heart. He is content and indifferent. He has no equal. Only one free of desire knows nothing of knowing, says nothing needs saying, sees nothing to see. He who is without desire excels, be he beggar or king. He no longer sees good or bad. What is lust or restraint or the desire for truth to the yogi who has reached life's goal and who embodies virtue and sincerity? The inner experience of one who is free of desire and suffering, who is content and reposes in self, how can it be described and of whom? The wise one's state never varies. Sleeping soundly, he is not asleep. Lying in reverie, he is not dreaming. Eyes open, he is not wakeful. The man of knowledge seems to think, but has no thoughts. He seems to have sense perceptions, but does not experience. He seems to have intelligence, but is empty-minded. He appears to be a person, but is not. The man of knowledge is neither happy nor miserable, neither detached nor attached, neither liberated nor seeking liberation. He is neither this nor that. Even while distracted, the Blessed One is still. In meditation, he does not meditate. In ignorance, he remains clear. Though learned, he knows nothing. The liberated one who abides unconditionally in self, who is free of the concept of action and duty, who is always and everywhere the same, is desireless. He does not worry about what he did or did not do. The wise one is neither pleased by praise nor annoyed by blame. He neither rejoices in life nor fears death. One of tranquil mind seeks neither crowds nor wilderness. He is the same wherever he goes. 19. Repose in the Self Janaka said, With the tongs of truth I have plucked the thorn of thinking from the innermost cave of my heart. Where is meditation, pleasure, 
prosperity, or discrimination? Where is duality? Where even is unity? I abide in the glory of self. Where is past and future, or even present? Where is space, or even eternity? I abide in the glory of self. Where is self? Where is not self? Where is good and evil, confusion and clarity? I abide in the glory of self. Where is sleeping, dreaming, waking, or even the fourth state? Where is fear? I abide in the glory of self. Where is close or far, in or out, gross or subtle? I abide in the glory of self. Where is life and death? Where is the world and worldly relations? Where is distraction and stillness? I abide in the glory of self. There is no need to talk about the three ends of life. To talk of yoga is purposeless. Even talking about truth is irrelevant. I rest in self alone. 20. Liberation in Life Janaka said, Where are the elements, the body, the organs, the mind? Where is the void? Where is despair? My nature is transparent clearness. Where is scripture? Where is self-knowledge? Where is no mind? Where is contentment and freedom from desire? I am empty of two-ness. Where is knowledge and ignorance? Where is I? Where is this? Where is mine? Where is bondage and liberation? Self has no attributes. Where is the unfolding of karma? Where is liberation in life? Or even liberation at death? There is only one. Where is the doer or enjoyer? Where is the origin or end of thought? Where is direct or reflected knowledge? There is no person here. Where is the world? Where is the seeker of liberation? Where is the contemplative? Where is the man of knowledge? Where is the soul in bondage? Where is the liberated soul? My nature is unity. Where are creation and destruction? Where is the end and the means? Where is the seeker? Where is attainment? I am one. Where is the knower? Where is knowing? Where is the known or knowledge itself? Where is anything? Where is nothing? I am pure awareness. Where is distraction, concentration, knowledge or delusion? Where is joy or sorrow? I am stillness. Where is the relative? Where the transcendent? Where is happiness or misery? I am empty of thought. Where is illusion? Where is existence? Where is attachment or non-attachment? Where is person? Where is God? I am awareness. Where is activity or inactivity? Where is liberation or bondage? I am timeless, indivisible. I am self alone. Where are principles and scriptures? Where is the disciple or teacher? 
Where is the reason for life? I am boundless, absolute. Where is existence or non-existence? Where is unity or duality? No thing emanates from me. No more can be said.